Our club has always been a forum for public figures, thought leaders, and decision makers to share their ideas. Here, we offer access to dynamic political, business, and public personalities. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Hello everyone and welcome to the Canadian Club of Toronto. Uh, for those of you joining us virtually online, we just had a little moment where we were coordinating the video that you watched and people being seated in the room. And I'm really enthusiastic about that because people are seated in the room. <laughs> My name is David Simmons. I'm president of the Canadian Club for our 125th season. We're delighted to welcome the Minister of Long-Term Care, the Honourable Rod Phillips. And we're also grateful to be joined by hundreds of Canadians virtually with the 200 Canadians in the room today. As you watch today's presentation, you can engage with us through social media using the hashtags and handles on your table. They're also coming up on screen. For those of you joining remotely, we invite you to hit submit a question on the screen uh, and we will find an appropriate time to use those questions in conversation with Minister Phillips today. And again, if you're in the room, there are Q&A cards on your table. Let me acknowledge today's event sponsor, Navigator, represented by Executive Chairman Jamie Watt. He's also a past president of the Canadian Club of Toronto. We're grateful for your support now and into the future. We're also thrilled to host some future long-term care leaders, currently students brought together by Colleges Ontario. I saw Linda Franklin here earlier, uh, and they are uh, here today sponsored by Ontario's Long-Term Care Association. I think I saw Donna Duncan here as well today. So there's a student table. Donna, Linda, thank you. Student table wave for everybody to see you. Now let me introduce today's speaker. The Honourable Rod Phillips has served as Ontario's Minister of Long-Term Care for almost a year. Previously, he served as Ontario's Minister of Finance and the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, Minister Phillips is the MPP for Ajax. He's also the former President and CEO of the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation, Volunteer Chair of Civic Action, and of course, he's a past President of the Canadian Club Toronto. Minister Phillips, we're honoured to hear from you again today on this very important topic. The Minister will be joined in conversation by Amanda Galbraith. She's a valued member of the Canadian Club of Toronto Board. She serves on the executive with me. She's a friend. She's a dynamic. You can listen to her uh, on several different media platforms. I do, weekly on iHeartRadio and News Talk 1010. And you can find her during the days uh, as a principal at Navigator. Amanda, I'll turn the podium over to you and Minister Phillips. These chairs are deep. Yeah, they are. That's comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been meaning to talk to you for a while. I didn't think I'd be doing it in front of like 200 people. Yes, this is, this is what it takes sometimes. <laughs> yeah. um, so, Minister, you know, you've been in this role for four months. Uh, how, how do you feel about it? How's it been going for you? Uh, first of all, just to, uh, to David and the Canadian Club, thanks so much for, for the invitation. It is, uh, it's always a pleasure as a former president uh, of the Canadian Club, but just as a, a citizen, as someone who's civically minded to see the uh, continued platform that the club provides. So thank you for that. Um, Amanda, 
It's, uh, this has been a very uh, interesting education for me. Uh, a lot of what has gone on in long-term care has been talked about very publicly and, and of course the tragedy of what happened during the pandemic uh, and the challenges we continue to face is all something for people to read about and, and we all have done that. But it's been remarkable the amount of goodwill from people in the industry, people in the homes, uh, representatives of, uh, of families, uh, representatives of residents uh, to, uh, to really get a, a handle on the situation. So, so, so far, a lot of it has been listening. Obviously, we're doing a lot of things too that I'll talk about. Uh, and a lot of it has been about trying to make sure that the work we've already been doing uh, to fix long-term care uh, gets, gets the government where it needs to get to in terms of really providing the support for, for, for an essential sector. So, so uh, you know, I, don't, I think it's a little early to have a report card. Uh, or I'll, <laughs> I'll leave it to the folks in the room for that. But, but I think, um, I, think I, I just would like to say, because there's a number of people here and I know some people watching, uh, thank uh, those of you who've taken the time. Uh, it's been very heartening to see the enthusiasm for the kinds of changes that need to be made. So it's, uh, so it's been, been very good so far. So let's talk about the kinds of changes that need to be made, right? Because I think it's been interesting to watch long-term care, which I think many in this room would argue has been neglected by successive governments from all stripes. Um, we had this moment in the pandemic where it was front and center news every day. People were galvanized. Um, that's obviously less happening less so currently. But is there the political will, I guess, in this government around the cabinet table to to make some of the changes, the investments that need to be made, so we don't see the tragic deaths we saw happen again? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, from a from a dollars perspective. I don't think anybody could debate the dollars that this government has put to work, and I'll, I'll summarize them briefly. Um, almost $3 billion to redevelop 20,000 of 30,000 beds that, that we've committed to. Uh, and later today, uh, you'll see the call for proposals for that beginning of that next tranche of 10,000 beds. Uh, so we're very focused on the physical part of, of the problem. And, and, and that's uh, really been something that was started by my colleague Christine Elliott and then followed through by Marilee Fullerton uh, and that focus. But, but when we look at this, uh, this challenge, we really see it in, in three separate uh, priority areas. The first is the physical, the physical beds. And uh, as I've talked about quite frequently, between 2011 and 2018, there was only 611 net new beds. Uh, that were built in the whole province while there was this escalating population of, of seniors who needed care. So uh, we are uh, in the process of, of developing 30,000 new beds, uh, but also dealing with things uh, like the uh, licenses that are coming up in 2025 and the need to make sure that we don't lose uh, beds uh, out the, of the system as well. Um, so that's the first component. The second component is around care and staffing. We've invested to date and targeted about $4.9 billion uh, to essentially move Ontario from the middle of the heap in terms of care per resident per day at about 2.75 hours to the top of the heap. So that's to four hours of care per day. And we start that next month. I announced a few weeks ago $270 million to hire 4,000 more staff. Uh, one of the things I've been doing is dropping by at long-term care homes, usually with an inspector, usually unannounced. And the thing you always hear about is the requirement for more people. Um, you hear it from the staff, you hear it from the residents, uh, you hear it from the, the people who, uh, who represent the staff and the residents and the, and the families. Uh, what that means for a typical, let's call it 200 bed home, will be six more nurses, you know, six more registered practical nurses, 25 more PSWs. So that's what four hours of care is going to mean. And I remember Tim Orr's, when I met in Brampton, I was out visiting with Mayor Brown, one of the homes that uh, we had just added uh, 100 beds to. And he was one of the residents. And he said, I said, what would you like? And he said, I only get to have a bath once or twice a week. He said, I'd like to bathe more often. But the reason that Timur can't get his bath isn't because the staff there aren't working hard. It isn't because there isn't the facilities, because this is a new facility. It's because there aren't enough of them. So that's the kind of real difference that that staffing increase in moving to four hours of care will make. And then the third piece that our government is uh, committed to, and I'll introduce uh, legislation in the coming weeks, that will really look at the accountability, the enforcement, and the transparency within the system with a brand new Long-Term Care Act. Uh, so the last act was uh, initiated in 2007. Obviously, a lot has changed since then. I was speaking to a PSW the other day in Whitby, and she had been at the home she was at for 30 years. And I said, what's the biggest difference now between today and when you started as a PSW? 
And she said, even 20 years ago, 20 years ago, most of the residents walked into the home themselves under their own power. The acuity, the, the level of, of, of illness and issue that, that our residents have now is just much, much magnified. So that means that we need to have an act that reflects those challenges, make sure that the enforcement regime is appropriate, not, not oppressive, but that we are able to deal with issues across a broad sector, um, that the staffing levels are appropriate and that the facilities are appropriate, because that is what the future increasingly looks like. It's, it's, uh, we are dealing with a, a resident population that is gonna have more challenges, not less, and that means we have to put the homes in a position and the staff in a position where they can properly support them, and I know they will. So you, I mean, you talked about a lot in there we wanna get into today, obviously, um, but particularly on staffing. Now, your government announced a lot of funding. There was criticism that came back that said, that's all good, but we can't, even if you increase wages and all, we cannot find the, the talent, not to mention the fact that talent is leaving. I don't think that's unique to this sector. It's yeah. certainly across the board um, with different, you know, uh, different industries and can't, but how I think acutely this is, as you just mentioned, felt that someone can't bathe more than two days a week to me. Like, I don't know, you probably wanna be sitting next to me if I couldn't bathe more than two days a week. Um, so what are you, what is the government going to do to address that? It is, the, the whole health human resource staffing issue is one of the principal focuses for myself, for Minister Elliott, for Minister Cho, who's responsible for seniors. I see Linda Franken's here, I think, from Colleges Ontario. We've as well been working with the colleges, the universities, as well as the private colleges. Um, so we've funded training through the public college system, the private college system, for 17,000 more PSWs. Um, and this is an, an accelerated program uh, where the government is essentially paying tuition. Uh, you will so soon see um, some promotion uh, for these campaigns because this is something that eventually, to get to that four hours of care, we need 27,000 more, uh, we say 20,000 more staff um, in a room like this where I know folks understand uh, the details. What we really need is 27,000 more FTEs. Uh, and so that's actually many more staff than, than 27,000 people. So we need to encourage and inspire people to go into these courses. And, and that's why the government has taken the, the approach this year um, and in subsequent years to fund that. And that's why we're working so closely with our colleges and universities, our public and private institutions, and with school boards uh, to, to see the training of those staff. For the first time, we've expanded nursing enrollment, 2,000 more nurses that are in class today learning. Um, so, so this is a, so funding the positions is critical, um, but also creating the workforce. Uh, and Amanda, I found some, you know, I've been traveling a lot to various uh, colleges uh, to, to speak to the PSWs uh, as they, you know, get into the system and, and, and understand their motivations. First of all, I have to say the motivations, uh, just like the people who are currently PSWs, um, this is about a bunch of very caring, empathetic individuals who want to spend their life helping people you couldn't want for better people. And I know that all of you who work in the sector know that the vast, vast majority of people uh, throughout the ranks of long-term care feel that way from the top to the bottom. Um, but I had one, uh, one comment from a, a young lady at Algonquin College, and uh, it made me feel a little bit old and then, uh, <laughs> because she said, you know, she goes, I don't remember 9-11, and I thought, well, I do. Um, but, um, but she said, I was told by my mom that a whole lot of people after 9-11 decided to be firefighters because they realized how brave and how important firefighters were. And some of you in the room will remember that. Hold on, Farrow, you're old enough. Jamie, you're old enough. <laughs> um, but but to, to remember that. But she said, you know, I feel the same way because of the way people honored frontline workers, the way people talked about what PSWs did. And so many of these uh, young people, and not so young people, don't want to just be a PSW and stop. Many of them want to bridge and ladder into other healthcare careers. And guess what? We need registered practical nurses. We need nurses. We need nurse practitioners as well. So, so this is um, as big a challenge, frankly, as providing the money and providing the dollars for the positions is a big challenge, but that provides certainty. Uh, but this is um, as big a challenge as trying to create that momentum uh, in the space for more staff. And I think it's going to take everybody's work to do that. So you mentioned something um, in your previous answer around inspections, which struck me as the most you thing that I've ever heard, which uh, um, you have been going around sort of clandestinely inspecting um, different residents and homes uh, with, you know, just yourself, which Rod and I, uh, used to, or Mr. and I used to speak when I worked for Meritori, and he would also do this all the time and drove me nuts. He just appear <laughs> in places. So I have sympathy for your staff, but can you tell us what you're seeing on the ground and why you think that's an important thing to do as the minister? When I, when I, as 
David mentioned in the introduction, my background is really in business and in different businesses I ran, I always found that the best way to operate was, um, of course, to get a, the best team you could do and, and work really hard with that team. But you also trust but verify, you have to understand what's happening, particularly in larger organizations and everybody should know you're doing that. So, so I have been dropping by at, uh, at homes. Uh, we had a Blair uh, Haynes, my chief staffs here. We had a, we had a pool in the office the first day I did it uh, at one of the homes in Toronto, uh, St. George to see how long it would take the CEO of the company that ran it to find out I was wandering around <laughs> on the second floor. And the answer was 43 minutes, just so you know, there was a good, uh, but, but the, but the, but the purpose of all that, the purpose of all that is just to a get a sense of what is happening. Not that any one visit I'm going to make is going to make or break anything. It is to get to talk to people. Although truthfully, you find better venues to talk to frontline workers because they're all so busy they don't have time to just put their feet up and talk to you. But you also learn, um, and 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 others have joined me on these. You learn you learn some of the realities uh, on the, uh, in the in the in the facilities. I went. I took uh, the finance minister Peter Bethenfall with me um, on one of these uh, one of these visits, and and he said he could tell that I I'd been on them before. It was we went very early in the morning, uh, about six a.m. Uh, to the facility, and and for those who are in the long term care space, you'll understand that the 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 smell and dynamic in a long term care facility in the morning is different than other times of of the day, uh, and that's for obvious reasons. And and so I could explain to Peter why that was. Right, because you've got a bunch of people, and the diapers haven't necessarily been changed, and that's the reality of long-term care and what workers are dealing with. And you meet—I remember there was a woman, uh, Beatrice, who's a uh, nurse, right? And and uh, and we we came there. It's kind of a funny story. We both showed up, and uh, and they let us in. I bring an inspector along. <laughs> Glad they, they, they let you in. And uh, well, the, well, the funny—this is the funny story. So then they they uh, they in, uh, then sh we went to find the. The, the nurse and she said fine and we were doing our just wandering around and visiting with folks and seeing what was happening and then um, she came back and checked she's obviously phoned somebody and she wanted to see ID like she thought maybe just people were randomly showing up disguised as cabinet ministers to uh, to uh, to uh, but 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 just to talk to this the commitment this is a woman like just imagine just finishing a 12-hour shift right responsible for all the people in that facility as the RNs are um, you get some real unique insights when you, when you have those, those visits. Um, and frankly, I think it also gave me a chance to spend time with our inspectors. They work very, very hard. Um, we are you know, understaffed in that area, and we've added staff. We've added 32 inspectors since we started, but, uh, but we need more, and we will have more. Uh, but, uh, but, but you learn about how that, how, uh, that from the front line, from people. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's the sort of thing you don't find out unless you go out there. Uh, and, uh, and so, so far it's been very successful and I, and I keep doing it. I kind of like the image of this rogue minister who just randomly shows up in the middle of the night uh, at people's uh, long-term care homes. Very undercover boss. Do yeah. you have an outfit? Yeah, I, sh I should. I should, I should try. I, do. I haven't offered. I haven't done this yet, but I, but I have committed to it. There's a program you can do to do a day as a PSW. I think that would probably do me some good. I think I might do half a day. I'm not sure I could take a whole day. Uh, but uh, but there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot to learn and understand about the sector. And I think all of us, and maybe then through some of these circumstances, you can help others understand the challenge. I mean, this is a, this is a, this is a space um, and people, you know, there's almost 100,000 people that work in long-term care in Ontario and probably two and a half times that across the country. And for all the reasons related to COVID, they've been under a whole lot of pressure and stress. And a whole lot of people have been very critical. And listen, there have been reasons um, to be critical, but we should never doubt the commitment of the vast, vast majority of the people who work in this space. And I think our job collectively is to build them up um, because we've got you know, more work to do. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've got lots of questions coming in, so keep them coming if you like. Uh, so this one, you've mentioned the massive expansion of beds your government's trying to do, but obviously you need buildings to put those beds in. So will the government be working with Infrastructure Ontario, CMHC, to help nonprofit homes get financing to build or develop? Them? That's a great question. So we, we have about 220 projects underway now, development and redevelopment projects across the province. Uh, so we often talk about the 30,000 net new beds we're going to build. To do that, we've got 16,000 beds in redevelopment. And as I mentioned, we have a number of um, licenses coming up in 2025 that would represent about 12,000 other beds. But again, we don't intend to lose. We need to keep beds, not lose beds. So there's a lot going on. But the sector in Ontario is really split into three parts. There are the, the for-profit operations, there's the municipal operations, and there is the not-for-profit operations. And so much of the innovation and really excitement uh, not to speak, you know, not, not to position it better than, than the other areas, but the not-for-profit sector, particularly when it comes to culturally specific care, 
um, really uh, has um, some fantastic opportunities. And so we have some wonderful um, on Chong, uh, the uh, Villa Colombos. We have some wonderful uh, legacy not-for-profits who've done some great jobs and continue to do that. But we have many, many new communities as well. That, that look to, to follow in those footsteps. And there are some realities in terms of the financing reality. Um, and, and again, not that the contracts or the relationships, the dollars from the government are the same, but it is different if you're a, if you're a private company or you're a municipality with a balance sheet and you're a not-for-profit. So this is an area we're looking at, uh, both specifically with some, uh, some, some organizations in terms of what the solutions uh, they need. Uh, we want to see that diversity of care continue. Uh, we think that's best. It's also necessary because we need to get so many beds built. So we need that all of these areas to, to flourish. Um, and, uh, and we're working closely with people like Lisa Levin from Advantage and others who are, who are helping point to the places where we can, you know, help more specifically as far as, uh, as the funding. But, but this is, you know, this is going to be, an, this is one of the largest, I'll call it infrastructure projects going on in the province right now. Um, there's a huge amount of, of building going on. Um, there's a huge amount of building that we need to continue and it needs to include not-for-profit. Um, this is an interesting question. It's one that's been debated, I think, a lot publicly is the role of profit versus not-for-profit. So how do you see that balance in the sector going forward? I said we need everybody's help to, uh, to, uh, to move forward at the pace we need to move forward. And again, my own um, experience of, of speaking, and I, I don't speak as much to the owners, but I speak to the managers in the homes and I speak to the, to the individuals who work in the homes. And, and again, I see a, a common motivation, uh, regardless of particular shareholding. Um, there was a, a motion that uh, the opposition brought the other day to, to uh, eliminate for profit care. And, and the comment I made to that, and listen, everybody's open to their interpretation and, and their options, but the reality of that would mean that in spend, instead of spending billions of dollars on care and billions of dollars on building homes, you'd be spending billions of dollars to expropriate private assets with all of the incumbent complexity, keeping in mind that over half of the homes in Ontario today are currently run by, by a, a, a a, co a company or a profit organization. You'd also stop in their tracks. I talked about 220 building projects. You'd stop 140 of them today, just like that. So I'm not sure how that gets us to where we've got to get to. You know, we've got an expanding population of elderly, not a contracting population of elderly. So we need those 30,000 beds. We need to redevelop the beds we have. And we need to get care starting next month with our government's support uh, into homes. And we need to get more staff into homes and eliminating half the sector and then putting that transition, whatever the ideological motivations people might have to do that, um, doesn't seem to me like a sensible way to address the problem. So we are though, and I've talked about the legislation, we are going to make sure, and not for any one segment of the, of the sector, but for, for everyone working in the sector, make sure that accountabilities are very, very clear. That the culture of enforcement is very, very clear. And I have to say, I've. I, I, without any uh, criticism of the people responsible on the inspection side, um, I'm not sure that was as clear as it should have been in the province of Ontario. Um, and make sure that there's transparency for, uh, for residents, for families, um, but for the public in general. And for example, when, when I issued the, the vaccine mandate requirement for long-term care homes on October 1st, we also made public the data on staff vaccination rates for every home in the province. That's because people should know that kind of information. You should know that if your loved one is in a home. So we will focus on accountability, enforcement, and transparency, but we are also going to be a place that welcomes all people who want to be invested in and, and live within the rules we set, um, because we need a diversity of opinion and a diversity approach to, to get to the best, the best outcomes. Uh, this is an interesting question. So the funding for, to uh, provide more staffing is welcome, exclamation point, so that's a good review. But the question is, have you spoken with the Immigration Minister regarding the ability to attract newcomers from outside of Canada to the healthcare sector? Like, where are we at with that? Um, bef before the election, I did speak actually to uh, the Deputy Prime Minister about this, and she expressed a, a particular interest uh, in, in, in the need to do this, and, and she had said she'd speak to Minister Medicino. Uh, we, we need to, uh, I was talking earlier with, with, uh, with some of the guests today about, about some of the, the detailed part of what needs to be done to move PSWs into the skilled worker category versus unskilled and other things that will truly help. Um, but, Ontario generally, putting aside long-term care, um, is working with Ottawa for more flexibility in terms of, of our immigration, uh, our ability to, and control is the wrong word, just direct the immigration uh, priorities. But if we're going to get to those 27,000 people, 
like I said, 20,000 FTEs, actually more people. There's no way we get there from here without providing uh, pathways. And so we, so we have had some of those conversations, I can't say since the election, because they've been busy getting organized, and that's fine. Um, the, other, the other part of that, you know, when I was with the PSW class the other day up at Seneca, um, I, I said, you know, I asked people to put their hands up. How many of you would like to move from being a PSW to be, a, let's say, a registered practical nurse? And about half of the folks put their hand up. And then I said, and just to question, how many of you are a foreign trained nurse? And about a quarter of the group were. And so you'll be hearing more from us about what the education folks call laddering and bridging. Um, how, and of course, this is nothing's ever easy to do. Uh, we would love to see foreign trained professionals become move from, let's say, being a PSW into, into one of the registered professions. But of course, we want them to do that while simultaneously putting in a full shift every day because we need people to work. <laughs> so it's taking some real creativity. And I commend the college sector and others uh, about looking at the creative ways to do that. But we'll, we'll provide the resources. Other people need to provide the motivation, and we're going to need the training sector broadly to provide the creativity. And you know, this is an ask, I'll say, on behalf of, of all the colleges to the operators in the room. One of the things we expect, we want our PSWs, and as well as our registered staff, to have direct experience working as, in placements. And some of the organizations in the room here are fantastic with that, and some of you not so much. So we need you, we need you to embrace the idea of bringing those students and take, you know, we want to retain as many of them as we can. That means they need to get real experience in the long-term care sector. Um, and so we need you to embrace that. And I know it's a little bit of extra work for a student to train them for the first few days, but that person could be your employee for the next 20 years. So. Um, we've got quite a few questions here on, on pay for RPNs, RPWs. Um, Bill 124, obviously the government brought in, which had a set level to increase. Is that something your government is gonna be looking at over the next year and revisiting given what has happened in the last bit and the need to retain talent in the sector? Yes, and we, we're looking at all of those features as those who have been following it will know. We provided pandemic bonuses and pay through the pandemic. We've provided a series of $3 wage enhancements for PSWs. Um, myself and Minister Elliott, Minister Cho are very aware of the issues that happen and related to wage compression uh, that happens, you know, in terms of others of these of these skilled positions. So, you know, the work environment has to be part of what that incentive is for people to want to come to work, and obviously, pay is part of that. The opportunity to work in some of the fabulous new facilities uh, that are being built is part of that. Um, opportunity for, to, for leadership development and a career, which includes what I talked about, laddering and bridging into other. That's all part of it. So, so those are all components of, of what, uh, what we're looking at as a government. And, and remember, this is uh, certainly my focus is on long-term care, um, but increasingly we're also going to be looking at the continuum um, through home care, you know, through to, through to death. And, and how, how do we as a government support people through that? I, I was speaking to a couple of folks, uh, guests here today, and I said, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about the first 20 years of our citizens' lives, and that's a great investment. Think of all the things we do, you know, from junior kindergarten to schooling to all the programs and things we provide. Well, it's time now to start to think more holistically about the last 20 years. Of course, the problem is none of us want to admit when that starts. Uh, but, um, but, it, but, but there's a reality we have, to, a conversation we have to have about that. Um, you'll see in some of the upcoming legislation um, a focus on palliative care. Something not everybody's aware of is that one third of the residents in our homes pass every year. That's one third of about 75,000 people, yet there isn't an explicit focus on the palliative aspect, right? So these are the kinds of conversations that we need to have as a society and, and we'll play our role as government. Um, but to think through, and, and, and then in doing so, back to the question about the health human resources, you know, that, that creates a much more robust path from a career perspective for people. I think that's an interesting question though, because I also do not like focusing on the fact that I'm aging and I'm trying not to, but that last 20 year piece, you know, assuming you had an endless font of money, and I know you're going to be announcing legislation, so you won't want to scoop yourself, but what do you think that should look like? You're the Minister of Long-Term Care, you've been in this job for four years, you've been around government for a long time. Like, what, what should we be doing in Ontario for the last 20 years of people's lives? I, I mean, there's a couple ways to, I'd, I'd say I'd start at the beginning and start at the end. I think it is tough to do, but important to have an honest conversation about how any of us would like to spend the last month of our life. And not because of any malice or misintent, many people spend it shuffling between silos within a health system. 
which is, I don't think that's what we would not want to do. Um, and, um, and so, so I think there's a, and there's great expertise, uh, even some of it in the room about, about what and how and why to face that. So I think that's important, right? But, but starting at the beginning of, of that, uh, of that time frame instead, uh, you know, government, as it is for the first 20 years, government is quite engaged and becomes more engaged and engaged differentially based on people's resources. Uh, not everybody needs the support of government, but there are those that do. And one of the very interesting things about the need for the kind of services that we provide in long-term care is that if you're 40 or 50 or even 60, we can't tell whether you're going to need to be in long-term care from a medical perspective, but about one in four of you will. And nobody knows when they're 30 or 40 or 50 or 60, quite often, whether that's the case. So, so I think the continuum of services uh, that include how do we have people age, in home, age at home. Uh, when I was finance minister, one of the things I was proud of, we introduced a, a stay-at-home tax credit to uh, fund and support renovations that people could have to make their homes accessible. There's, so there's things we can do to make it easier to, to stay in our homes. Um, there are many, many families that are quite open to, in fact, want to have multi-generational living in their home, but they still need support and how does the home care system evolve to provide that um, it reminds me of a story uh, Louise uh, she's one of she's a hundred years old in Ajax uh, she's we had a, we just we just opened a parquet for Louise and Louise um, Louise is famous not just in Ajax but but everywhere because Louise is one of the bomb girls and so, uh, so she, we had a whole set of, uh, of uh, anniversary bomb girls, for anybody who doesn't know, were, were um, women during the Second World War who came from around Canada to build munitions in what would become Ajax. Ajax was in a town then, but, but people would come there and there's just many, many women and there's been books and TV series about it. So Louise, uh, we were opening a parquet because she just turned 100 and she started grabbing me by the arm and she pulled me over and, and we're building a new long-term care facility attached to the hospital there. It'd be 364 new beds. So she goes, you know, Rod, uh, you know, I've lived in my home now for, you know, 78 years. Uh, so I've saved you guys a lot of money. <laughs> so. I think it's only fair that I get a bed in one of the in that nice new place. <laughs> but but you know, but but we want as many people like Louise to be able to live as long as they can. But it's entirely reasonable to assume that most of us won't be able to. And so that's the opportunity. Thinking about it holistically, and then trying to you know take the various component parts of what right now can be somewhat siloed government support to make them work. Like a, a you know a continuum of care is what we call it, but I think you have to watch that kind of um, consultant speak. I think it's just about you know what would you want for your mom and dad at a given time. You know people ask me what will the legislation look like and and what will we expect? What would you expect? I mean we would just want everybody to treat every resident and every senior like they were your mom or dad, and uh, and if we can do that, then we'll be successful. Uh, this is a bit of an open-ended one, but I think it's important. You know. You're four years in, or four, four, four months into it, not four years into it. We'll see, I guess, in June. <laughs> I think, June? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thought I might get you. Um, you're four months into this job, and this is a question I've gotten a few times, actually. What's the biggest lesson you've learned um, in your role as a Minister of Long-Term Care? Hmm. Well, I learned why the home smells different at 6 a.m. in the morning than, uh, <laughs> than, than, than at a different time of day. Um, listen, I, this issue, I think, I, I didn't quite know what to expect. It had been a very politicized issue. It continued, there continue to be people with very strong points of view. But I think the surprise for me, and maybe it's because I've been involved in politics uh, for a little while, is the amount of goodwill that people have in terms of wanting to see this solved. And maybe it's because we're all getting older. Like that's just, maybe it's just shameless self-interest. Um, it, it, it is certainly because of what people saw through COVID, right? And some of the very tragic, tragic scenes and things that none of us would have wanted to have happen uh, in our province or in our country, um, as a result of uh, as a result of the pandemic, but um, but there is genuine goodwill, and that doesn't mean there won't be robust debate and strong points of view about what should be done, and that doesn't always happen, as you know, in yes. in, in politics, and even even the folks across the aisle um, in the in the legislature are um, you know they're not not going to show up for the opening of the new home in their riding, um, they're not not going to thank us for the extra million dollars next month and four million dollars in four years for staff um and um and the, and they're you know i think the general willingness of people to be constructive has been positive uh so we're about to wrap up so assuming at some point you may or may not leave this portfolio what's the one thing you'd like to have accomplished in your time here hmm. so, 
I think if, if I guess what I was saying, if, if we can set ourselves on a path uh, that, uh, that sees the building of more state-of-the-art homes, that sees the increases of staffing, um, and, and that sets a framework from a legislative point of view um, where we can restore confidence, because I think confidence has been shaken uh, in people, and, and that's not a surprise. Uh, and I say that, again, not as a criticism of the people who work very hard in the sector, but people saw what they saw and what happened happened, um, and close to 4,000 people died. And so I think the ability to um, have people feel confident that the system is going in the right direction, and, uh, and that won't just be my accomplishment, that'll be the accomplishment of a lot of, a lot of people. Um, and, uh, and I'm just back to what you said, it was, was the, the best, uh, the most interesting thing I found is, I think that can harness that goodwill, that enthusiasm of that young PSW student who wants to spend a career in healthcare, in long-term care, um, because she sees a community that cares about it and sees something that can, you know, make her uh, have, a, have a meaningful uh, career, um, that would be a success. Okay. Thank you very much, Minister, for your time today. Thank you. Sticking around. We get up? I don't know. David will tell us. We... Normally, I'd shake all your hands, but it's, you know, we're still in a pandemic, so thank you. Um, On behalf of the Canadian Club of Toronto, thank you for joining us today, Minister Phillips. We appreciate the conversation. And Amanda, thank you for the expert moderation of that discussion. Um, I think the thing I took away from this conversation, there's a parenting uh, theorist that I read because, you know, I don't have kids, so I read her. Uh, her name is Barbara Coloroso, and she talks about a circle of caring and that our words, our actions, and our intentions either pull people in or push them out of that circle. And I'm encouraged today because I think in the conversation you've had, we're talking about pulling our parents, our grandparents, our friends into a circle of caring through actions, deeds, words, and policy. So thank you, Minister, uh, for your initiative, your effort, and we wish you uh, the best of luck in building that circle. Uh, before we close, I want to thank another, uh, extend another thank you to today's sponsor, Navigator. Jamie, thank you for being here and thank you for your support. We do appreciate it. Um, let me also take an opportunity to invite you to join us at future through events on October 26th, we will host Patricia Gaither, General Manager of Moderna Canada. Are you Moderna? Are you a Pfizer? I'm just kidding. Uh, so join us for that event. Uh, she'll be talking about building the vaccine supply chain in Canada. I spent 10 years in healthcare. Could you believe that? Um, the following day, we'll host the former governor of the Bank of Canada, David Dodge, for conversation on the future of Canada's economy. And on November 2nd, we'll be back in person here. We invite you to join us. We'll be hosting Eric Martel, President and CEO of Bombardier, to hear about his vision and mission for the future of the company and the key role that Ontario will play in that development. Let me conclude uh, our time by thanking LiveMeeting.ca, Canada's online event space, and VC VVC for live streaming today's event. Uh, members and guests, thank you for joining us. Uh, continue to join us online. Thank you for your engagement in the club. Uh, take care and be well.